Hi, and welcome to another lecture in aerodynamics. Today, we visit a simple concept with complex origins, the lift force. To this point, we have built models and derived equations that tell us all about how to predict lift, including thin airfoil theory. This rested on concepts like the Kutta-Joukowsky theorem, which allows us to relate the circulation in a flow to the lift that's produced. Also, the Bernoulli principle allows us to make a relationship between pressure and velocity along a streamline. However, none of these concepts completely answers a straightforward question. What causes the lift? Where does it come from? How can we explain it from fundamental origins? And judging by the number of YouTube videos and forum topics dedicated to this question, the answer isn't as easy or convenient as we'd like it to be. And today, we try and answer these questions. We will show that lift is a balance and interaction of all three conservation principles, conservation of mass, momentum, and energy. Before we begin, it's important to note that I found a few specific other videos helpful in forming my own thoughts and opinions on the matter, and those are linked in the description. Another note is that these explanations are for low angle of attack subsonic wings. Supersonic wings bring other complexities, like shock waves that produce their own forces, and separation breaks a lot of concepts we talk about today. Okay, let's jump in. Consider an airfoil. Airfoils come in all shapes and sizes, but are generally designed with some common features. There's generally a rounded nose at the front, a sharp trailing edge, the foil cruises at a moderate angle of attack relative to the flow, and the top is curved with a smooth and slender shape. Flow passes over the foil and bends around it. On the top of the foil, there is a large low pressure region, and near the nose there is commonly a smaller high pressure region. This low pressure region is what produces lift force. Recall that the only two ways a body in aerodynamics can feel force is through pressure and shear. Here we have a pressure, specifically a pressure difference, on the top and bottom of the foil, and that creates force on our body. This force is lift. But why does the low pressure region exist? What causes this force? Before digging into the answer, let's clear up a few misconceptions that are often used as an oversimplification of the lift generation. First, the most common er erroneous explanation for lift is something called the equal time explanation. If you set a foil in a flow, the air goes over and under the foil. Picture a pair of particles that start at the beginning of the foil at the same time. One of the particles goes above and over the foil, and the other goes underneath. By some magical force, these two particles are destined to meet at the exact same time at the back of the foil. As a result, the top particle has to move much faster because the distance it has to travel is longer. Longer distance in the same time means greater velocity, and through Bernoulli, that means that the pressure is lower. And lower pressure leads to pressure difference, which leads to force. The primary flaw in this argument is that there's nothing forcing the two particles to meet at the same time in the back of the foil. The top particle does not care about the underside of the foil, and vice versa. Picture a flat shape with one side jagged and rough and the other side smooth. If this principle were to hold true, this would be a shape that produces considerable lift because the top surface is much longer. However, this is not a lift-producing surface. Similarly, we know airfoils can fly inverted and still generate lift, which would not be possible with this theory, because the underside of the foil is still longer distance than the upside when it's turned upside down. The second major issue with this theory is that it's comparing the velocity and pressure using Bernoulli on two separate streamlines. For Bernoulli to work on a streamline, you need incompressible inviscid flow. But for it to work off of a streamline, you need the additional constraint of flow to be irrotational. This is not guaranteed in these situations, and I don't think the assumption is justified here. However, there are correct aspects to this theory, which is likely why it's so catchy to begin with. First, along the streamline on the top surface, the flow certainly accelerates. This means velocity goes up and pressure goes down on that streamline due to Bernoulli, and is a main contributor to lift. Secondly, 
the velocity on the top surface is much, much faster than the bottom. However, this acceleration has physical roots that we will explore later that are not explained by this theory. Okay, so now we know equal time is a flawed argument. The second common erroneous explanation is that air pushes on the foil from the bottom. Here, a foil is placed at an angle of attack in the flow. The idea here is that the airflow bashes into the underside of the foil and bounces off. In order to absorb the flow redirection, there's a reaction force on the foil that results in lift. Similarly, if you were to bounce a basketball against a wall, the wall feels a reaction force due to having to absorb that bouncing. The primary issue with this explanation is that it's really not how air behaves. It doesn't bounce off the bottom like a bouncy ball. Air is going to want to flow, follow the surface of the foil on the, both the top and bottom side, and there are a lot of forces generated between air interaction particles that are not captured by this idea. However, there's a correct foundation to this. The flow does change direction due to the presence of the foil, and that redirection does take a force, and that force is lift. And this leads nicely into the next related topic, which is less of a misconception and more of an incomplete reasoning. The idea here is that the foil placed in the flow acts to turn it or redirect it to downwards. If air starts going from left to right and a portion of it becomes vectored downwards, it takes a force to induce that flow acceleration. Downward direction means upward force, meaning lift. And there's nothing incorrect about this, it's certainly true. The only issue with this explanation is it's that not really an explanation at all. It isn't a reason why lift occurs. The downward turning and flow rotation is more of a footprint of the, what the foil is doing. It's a consequence of the lift, not a reason for why the lift happens. For example, it doesn't explain why flow wouldn't just pass by the foil and disregard its angle or even wrap around the back side of the foil so that it can still exit horizontally on the back side. We seek a more complete definition and reason for lift. Each of these common misconceptions have truth embedded in them. To fully understand the source of lift, we will need aspects of our three main conservation equations. Conservation of mass is going to tell us why, in certain areas, flow accelerates over the foil. The conservation of energy is what allows us to relate this flow acceleration to reaction force through Bernoulli. And the conservation of momentum is what we use to relate the added circulation to the flow to the lift producing it. Consider again a foil at an angle of attack with flow passing over it. We're going to consider the foil in three main sections. At the nose is section 1, where there is accelerated flow. Over the top curvature is section 2, where flow stays attached to the surface despite its curvature. And at the trailing edge is a section 3, where flow exits nice and parallel and cleanly. This results in flow being turned downwards and the body feeling lift. Let's consider each section in detail. At the nose, we have a dramatic increase in flow velocity, which happens as a result of the conservation of mass. Consider flow through a channel with a converging cross-section. Flow comes in with velocity u1 and leaves with velocity u3, and in this case u1 equals u3. However, in the middle, we have acceleration because of mass conservation. m dot be conserved means rho ua is equal everywhere, and since the density is the same, if our cross-sectional area goes down, the velocity must go up. This same phenomena happens at the front of our foil, despite our channel not having a roof. The rapid change in curvature results in the same amount of fluid needing to pass through a smaller space, so flow accelerates to compensate for that. So the front curvature acts to speed the flow up, and the Bernoulli principle tells us that the pressure must go down as a result. This flow acceleration is the primary reason for the low pressure region over the foil. Our next region is the curvature on the top surface where flow tends to stick or stay attached to the surface. In fluid mechanics, we learn about something called the Kwanda effect. If you were to take the back side of a spoon or a cup turned on its side and place it in a faucet, you would notice that flow tends to bend around the curvature 
and stays on the surface, despite bending further than its original direction. This is the Kawanda effect in action. Flow tends to prefer to stay attached to a surface, even if it curves. The effect was derived looking into the stability of jets. Consider a jet of air in the open. The jet entrains surrounding fluid, meaning it pulls outside fluid into the jet. This happens symmetrically. However, if the jet's near a wall, the impact becomes asymmetric. Entrainment still happens on the top, but on the bottom there's very little fluid to pull into the jet. This dramatically reduces the pressure between the jet and the wall, and this creates a pressure difference that forces the jet towards the wall. The jet is most stable being attached to the wall, and in order to be convinced to separate from the wall, it needs a considerable countering force. We see the same effect over curvature like on the backside of an airfoil. This is what lets the foil angle and guide the flow downwards, changing its direction, instead of the flow just exiting the surface before turning. And finally, we have the trailing edge section of the foil, where the flow tends to exit cleanly and parallel to the surface. The clean exit is due to the cutta condition. Consider a sharp trailing edge in two scenarios. The first scenario is where the flow exits cleanly. In the second scenario, the flow bends around the back sharp edge of the foil, goes back up the back side, and then exits away from the trailing edge. The cutta condition states that flow prefers to leave smoothly at that sharp trailing edge. It's the choice that we tend to observe in application. It's really nature's preference. The cutta condition is more of an observation than a physical law, but it's likely due to the fact that the, having the sharp trailing edge means that flow would need to instantaneously change direction to be able to go back up the foil top side. This instantaneous change in direction would take a ton of energy, and nature prefers low energy states. This means that the clean exit is also the easiest and most likely to happen. You might recall from elementary flows that the flow over an airfoil can be recreated with two subcategory flows. The first is a uniform flow passing by the foil and ex exiting unturned in an unphysical way. The second is circular rotation around the foil. If you combine these two flows together, you get the true behavior over an airfoil. It's the rotation portion of this addition of elementary flows that it indicates lift, because circulation is directly related to the lift through the kutta joukowsky theorem. So, the kutta condition is partially responsible for the lift production. To conclude, let's summarize these three sections again. When you place a curved foil at an angle of attack in a fluid, the streamlines bend around the foil. Initially, flow accelerates due to the conservation of momentum. More fluid has to pass through less space. This, because of the conservation of energy in the Bernoulli principle, means that pressure in this region goes down. After the nose, the flow bends around and stays attached to the foil surface due to the Kawanda effect. At the trailing edge, the cutter condition forces the flow to exit cleanly and parallel to the top and bottom surface. As a result, the flow is bent downwards as it exits. All of this combines to generate one lift vector in the foil center of pressure. Lift, while simple in nature and definition, is complex in origin and often generates confusion. It is a synergistic interaction of the conservation of mass conservation of momentum, and the conservation of energy, where each play a vital role in the origin of lift. And that's it. I hope you enjoyed the video, and thanks for watching.